Ron Barron is here. He's the CEO and CIO of Barron Funds. Tesla is the firm's eighth largest investment, representing 1.72% of Barron Funds' total assets. Ron has been a big bull on Tesla shares and has been a huge defender of Elon Musk. And Ron, thanks for coming in today. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, so there's been a lot that's happened since the last time that we talked to you. So you want to talk about Tesla today? Let's start with Tesla. <laughs> Let's start what happened because we now have this SEC settlement. But I just wonder, as an investor, someone who's been supporting him for all of this time, what did you think when you woke up last Friday morning and heard that there was an SEC deal that he had walked away from? Well, I, I didn't think that was a great idea. And when he had uh, not received support from his shareholders, for a going private transaction, he flipped around and changed and canceled the transaction. And when I didn't think he was going to receive support for this, uh, walking away from that settlement, I presumed that he was going to go out and renegotiate and do it again. Let, let me just back up on this. The the going private transaction. I mean, that's why this SEC suit is here, because yes. the SEC doesn't think there was ever any pri going private transaction. This was him just kind of sending out a tweet on a very loosely based idea. That was not a transaction that he canceled, I don't think. It was a pro proposed transaction, and he, this is just from reading the media, mm -hmm. it was a proposed transaction, and I assume that he thought that he had financing, but uh, you know, the SEC didn't meet the regulations for the SEC uh, to make such a statement, and so uh, they had a settlement. What did you think of that idea? And I should note, uh, in a letter to the SEC from Elon Musk, he talks specifically about you uh, and having discussions with Barron Funds about rolling into his transaction. So what was your view at that time? Well, I said that I didn't want to sell at $420 a share. And I had a proposal that the special uh, committee was going to consider about being able to uh, invest in the private company uh, through an entity that I was intending to form. Um, but I thought that this wasn't, I, th I would prefer that the company remain public. You know, it, it, when we're getting all this uh, into the weeds, I'm not the expert on the law, but I would think that uh, rather than this exact uh, you know, controversy is going on right now. I think the most important thing about Tesla in the long term is that their stock price is going to depend on how many cars they sell, how many cars they make, how much profit they're going to make per car. Can the battery business be as big as the car business? How fast is this company going to grow? That's, that's what it's going and to depend on. And if they have on. enough funding to get to those points, I think. Well, I think they're going to be self-funding. Uh, very, very, very close to self-funding if they're not already. There's going to be a lot of flow that's being produced. Um, I'll talk about the fundamentals. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that uh, they're very close. They were supposed to, when they were making these cars, these Model 3 cars, they were supposed to cost, when they got to 10,000 cars a week, uh, they were supposed to cost about $28,000 per car that they made. And they were planning to sell them for $42,000 per car. They're now 5,000 cars a week and, uh, of, of Model 3s. And so there was a nice profit built into every car they were going to sell. However, instead of selling them for $42,000 a car, right now they happen to be selling for $62,000 a car because people are ordering all kinds of options, big batteries, rear wheel drive, all wheel drives rather, uh, which is five or $6,000 extra. So, so right now, if they were running at, at $10,000 a car, at 10,000 cars a week, they would make an enormous amount of money. And they will be making an enormous amount of money even at, uh, at, at $42,000 a car when they get there. But, um, you know, so, so how many cars are they going to sell? How much money are they going to make on them? How big is this battery business going to get to be? Uh, in the context of, uh, of this settlement that was just announced, uh, where Tesla is going to improve the governance, uh, uh, that uh, Elon Musk is going to remain the CEO, and he is the driving force uh, for this company, uh, that they will, uh, you know, so you're going to eliminate distractions. Um, uh, the communications with investors are now going to be overseen. I think this Meaning is Meaning he's not going to be tweeting anything about the company. Uh, well, I, I presume... Except that he is, by the way, because he's been doing, even overnight, he had a handful of tweets that were related to the company. And so... Uh, the, the, the uh, you know, he's supposed to be, I think he's communicating, what, what did he say? <laughs> uh, it just, just, I mean, the, 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 I don't think that these would necessarily constitute material, material tweets. He had a handful of, of things about SpaceX, but in reference to, for example, Tesla's stock, he says something especially weird going on with Yahoo News Feed on iPhone stocks app 
almost always super negative, meaning about Tesla, may be getting gamed. So now he's suggesting that somehow uh, the stock is getting gamed. So, so, I, so I believe that investors would, uh, would benefit if there were less communications. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, there were none, and the stock was up 12% in a week. So I think that the more communication about things that are extraneous to Tesla, the, the less uh, invest, the more uncomfortable investors are going to see, the more less conventional it's going to be. Uh, and people like convention if they're going to attribute a $50 billion value to a business. And I think that the SEC uh, would get a benefit from this settlement also. So it's not just for Tesla shareholders and not just for Tesla, but it's for the SEC. The SEC wants to have some kind of control over what CEOs of businesses right. are able to communicate through social media to their investors, the which stock, is, a, the is stock, a positive. The stock was down on Friday because people didn't, uh, for a multiple of reasons, people didn't want to see C, him taken out as the CEO. Yes. They also didn't want this ongoing investigation that would prevent them from being able to go back and potentially tap the markets for additional capital if it needed. You have him here now with the condition that there's going to be a chairman who's brought in. Um, do you think that that person, that chairman, should be an outsider? Or would it be okay with you if it's somebody who's on the board right now, that same board that has been here f for everything we've seen? I'd like to see who it is. I, I don't want to judge. I don't want to tell people how to would run you, businesses. Would you take a board seat if asked? No. You would not? No. Because of your, your position in the company? I don't, I don't, I'm not an active investor, activist investor. I communicate regularly right. with companies, but I've been asked a number of times to be on boards. I don't want to be on someone's board. What do you make, though, of the current? On anyone's board. Well, what do you make of the current board, though? Because the, the, the critique is that, they are, that there is no, I, I dare I say, adults in the room or people who are at least willing or able to control Elon Musk. No. Uh, when you look at a business from the outside, as I said, this company's valuation is going to depend on how many cars they sell and, and uh, how much they make on the cars and how many they can make, uh, how much profits they're going to make per car and how many batteries they're going to sell. It's not going to depend on whether we like or don't like a tweet that comes out of, of, uh, of the CEO. Um, the president uh, tweets all the time, 40% of the people love it and 60% don't. It's not that good to You could argue that Elon Musk pulled a rabbit out of the hat in this last 24-hour period with, with the SEC. The SEC could have said, go pound sand, or we're going to make this even more complicated for you than, than you think. There isn't any way that they want it. I was reading a, an interview with Jay Powell, and he said that, uh, uh, that uh, Elon Musk is material to the prospects of, uh, of uh, you know, having the ability of this company to execute, and he doesn't want to damage the company, doesn't want to damage the shareholders, doesn't want to damage the community. This guy, you know, how, how upsetting must it be to an individual like Elon Musk who's working his butt off to try to change the world and uh, get rid of carbon emissions and, uh, and right. help the environment and, uh, uh, and, and for every day to be criticized because he has, uh, he's different than most people and he'll tweet. I mean, so, so I'm not, I don't think. But you said yourself you don't want the tweets. So I would you prefer want him not. to be a little more. I prefer not. I prefer him to be more, you know, right. in the box. What kind of person would you want to be the chairman of the company? Um, I think that uh, someone who had a regulatory experience, someone who's done very well, someone from a business that has great manufacturing expertise. Right. Um, on, the, on the operations... I'm sure I don't, they don't need me to right. tell them what they should choose for an investor, but I'd like to have someone substantial. On the operations side, you talk about just meeting or at least making the numbers. This becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if they can make the numbers. From an operations perspective, how do you feel about the fact that they have even in this past weekend or week, uh, enlisted volunteers to deliver cars, um, that there are questions about cars in parking lots, that they've offered su uh, extra um, uh, promotions for, for free uh, supercharging. Uh, what, what does that say about, about, about where they, they are in terms of the development of the, the production line? You know, I mean, there the, the, are, these are the issues the shorts, shorts and, and others would raise. You know, when, when you look at this company, that has gone when we started to invest in it. So, you know, I did a friend a favor about uh, 10 years ago, and he was formerly the head of, uh, of Oakmark, and we went to law school together. And he was telling me that he is now going to mentor an individual in a private equity investment, and if I invested in that equity, in, in private equity, then it would be helpful to him as far as raising money for other investors. So I said, I only invest in our mutual funds, but Vic, I know you since 1966, and 
and of, of course I'll do whatever you want. So I invested some money. Your money. Not my money. money. This yeah. just my money yeah. in this partnership. And the first stock that I got back was Tesla stock, $3 a share. That was my cost, $3 a share. They give me stock back. And then they're getting ready to go public, and he comes to visit me. Elon does. Elon does, when, in his roadshow. And we talk for a couple hours, and I say, I can't understand how this can be successful. And in fact, I just gave you, a, you know, a, a table here. There's 50 car companies that have failed in the past, uh, since 1950s, 50 of them. Just one after another. Just look at these, all these companies. Yeah. I mean, Nash Rambler, American Motors, uh, Bricklin, Checker, uh, Dale DeLorean, DeSoto, 50 companies. I said, there's no way this can be successful. And then they take a car out to my house in Long Island, and I test drive it. And when it's roadsters, I can hardly get into it. And so I said, this is a crazy car, so fast, and how am I going to know I'm not going to get crushed or run over on the highway? And so I get back to the office, and this, this $3 stock that I had, I sell. And it's uh, now 25 or $30, sell it. And, uh, and then, but I keep following the company in case there is something that I'm missing. And we keep watching it. And then in 2014 or 13, I realized I made a mistake. And the stock's now 80. We go out and Mike Lippert and I go out and visit him. We spend a couple hours with him. And I say, oh my God, this is terrible. I made it. But Mike at least owned the stock. And they say, uh, after that meeting, I say, Mike, you know, at least you're smart enough to own it, and I don't. Congratulations. He says, Ron, I sold it. So you sold it after you listened to what he had to say? You sold the stock? Are you kidding me? And uh, he says, yeah, I did. And now the stock is 70 or $80 a share, and all of a sudden they're starting to deliver these Model S's. And I say, i got to buy the stock. I, I have to. And the stock goes to, uh, in 2014, it's 160 160 I sold stock at 25 or 30 and I say, okay, I have to own stock. And so we start buying stock at 160 and we buy stock uh, between 160 and 230. Our average cost is 219 over a, between 2014 and 2016 for a million uh, 650,000 shares. And I think that we can make 20 times our money. Ron, one, one question, one, one issue that's been brought up, and, and this was from Bob Lutz on Friday, and I know Bob Lutz hasn't liked this from the beginning. He's an old line car company guy. He says they're going to go bankrupt. He thinks they're going to go bankrupt, but he brought up a point on Friday that I hadn't really considered before, and that's that the not having dealers is a huge disadvantage over the long run from a financial perspective because when you have a dealership network, they take the ownership of the vehicle from the minute it moves out of the factory. If you don't have that dealer network system, then this is inventory that has to sit on your balance sheet. Same thing in terms of uh, used car sales. How do you handle that if you don't have a dealer network that does it? I did a little more research on it, and it turns out that Henry Ford was the one who invented the dealership model, and he did it because Ford was short of cash at that point. The dealership model allowed it so that he could have this inventory and move out the doors. Local dealerships would take out their own loans from their local banks, and that way the organization would have a much bigger float, and it wouldn't be riding necessarily on the company. That, that's an argument that kind of makes sense to me. Why, why is Tesla so, so Henry why Ford, when he formed his dealer network, you're right, it was because he didn't have enough capital. Right. Um, and, uh, and, he, and so he couldn't build them and own them, and, and, and he had to have some way to get them out in the field. And the dealers, uh, several years later, invested millions of dollars in each of their businesses. And what happened to them is that they became incredibly successful and powerful and a lobbying powerful. They have perpetual licenses. That means that whatever car, they're getting a rake off of all the profitability that's sold, uh, that is achieved by all auto companies. And you're right, they do take inventory, but a Tesla, manu and so there's several months of inventory that they're, and the dealers are holding, that's a big risk. That means that the car dealer, the car owner, uh, you know, the car company, he's at risk that these guys aren't gonna sell that inventory and they're gonna have to write off some specials. Tesla only manufactures to orders. When they get an order, they make your car. And if they don't have an order, they don't make the car. And from the time they take an order, in 28 days, they're able to deliver that car to the purchaser, direct, direct to consumer. There's nobody, no dealer in between. The, de the credit of Tesla is so good with the suppliers that the suppliers give them terms, and oftentimes it's two or three months. So basically, they're getting paid in 28 days, and they're not uh, having to pay the people who built the car, the people who have the metal, the, uh, 
for for twenty for sixty days or ninety days. Now that's so, counter to what we've heard in, in some news reports float. from the suppliers. The, the, the suppliers say that Tesla has tried to push for tougher deals than they have with other companies. You're, Everybody you're pushes that, for tough deals. Yeah. Every single car company pushes for so tough you're, deals. So you're saying suppliers don't when have any concerns. When this company does a billion dollars a month of revenues, they're getting a billion dollars a float. A billion dollars a float. So they're creating float every time they're selling cars that they don't, you know, they, right. They, right? That's so. This is a this is a float. This is a positive float. So they're getting a billion dollars in float every time they sell a billion dollars in cars. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, you know, that's that's you know above the level. So if you, if they do a billion dollars a month now, then they have a billion dollars in float. Two dollars, two billion dollars means two billion dollars in float. So that's a very positive thing. Uh, in addition to that, they get ZEV credits, uh, $5,000 a car. In addition to that, as I just described to you, they were planning on making ten or $12,000 a car in profits when they're making $10,000 a car. I think they're going to make twice that you know, for a while. And when, but when they come down, they're not going to sell below $50,000 a car for another year. Do, do the credits matter if the credits go away? Um, the credits, ZEV credits mean that there's, I think, uh, nine states or ten states right. where every time you're selling a car that's a gas guzzler or a big truck, right. then you have to buy a credit to allow you to sell that car in the state. But I and, just wonder if regulation changes at the state model and some of those credits go well, away. I'm not assuming that's going to last forever, but so far mm -hmm. more and more states are doing it and they're giving a bigger and bigger percentage. So it starts at 2% of the cars you sell, then it goes to 4%, then it goes to, so demand <clears throat> should be going up. The only reason the car companies, the, uh, the big OEMs are making these uh, electric cars, they're not making money on them, right. is they can get the ZEV credits, they don't have to give it to Tesla. But can, can you speak to the issue that the shorts raise, and, and in particular we were talking about this story earlier today that the New York Times published with these images from short sellers, admittedly, who have been flying around with airplanes, taking pictures of parking lots where there's uh, apparently, in some cases, dozens, if not hundreds of, of vehicles. Uh, and the explanation from Tesla is not always clear about why those cars are there, what's going on, there's, there's issues around whether they need to be fixed after they've come off the line and then, and then there's volunteer service to, when, to deliver them. J Jamie Stone in my office had a Porsche. He bought a Model 3. He said it's, you, you, it's not comparable to a Porsche. He says it's unbelievably different. Uh, our trader, David Schneider, just bought a Model 3. He says it's the best car he's ever had. My kids have, uh, one of my sons has a Model X. He says he will never own another car other than a Tesla, never. And if you talk to anyone who owns these Model 3s, they'll tell you the same thing. It's unbelievable, the quality, and it keeps getting better and better and better. And those, they're, they're buying, I assume, the and, and so you're sixty right. and $75,000 version. So you're right. Uh, with, uh, with General Motors, when they're making uh, cars in their plants, they get 97% without, uh, with, without uh, defects. When Tesla has them, when you see those cars sitting around, that's going to make them real fast, and they're early on the, on, the, on the ramp up. And when they're making them like that, what happens is that you don't, have uh, you see? Have you have to make sure everything runs right, and so they're not they're not making 97 percent yet, but the percentage they're making is higher and higher and higher. You know, I was out with a couple of guys, I guess three people in my office, and we were out at the General Motors plant in uh, Orion, Ohio, last Wednesday, and we were with the president of General Motors. He was four and a half hours, and this whole team, and we're walking around the plant, and we're talking. This is where they're making the Bolt, and this is also where they're making uh, the Robo Taxis. And he was telling me, just to, to cut to the chase here, he said, what Tesla has accomplished is extraordinary. Extraordinary. My first question to, and Mary Barra says the same thing. My first question to him was that, you know, you got all these billions of dollars invested in plants that make motors. You're not going to need motors anymore. Uh, how is it that you're able to convince the board of General Motors to make these huge investments that are required in batteries and electric cars now, how do you, and the dealers don't want to sell them because there's nothing to fix. The dealers make all their money on fixing stuff as opposed to selling stuff. Uh, how do you get your board to do that? He says, well, Ron, uh, there's a canary in the coal mine, is the way he said it. Canaries in the coal mine. What's a canary in the coal mine? He said, well, uh, we noticed that the General Motors uh, consumers are using Uber and Lyft. We see mm -hmm. these changes. He says in the next 10 years, the automobile industry is not going to be recognizable. Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, uh, Dan, who I think is an incredibly talented guy. Dan uh, Ammon? Yep. Uh, he says that, uh, that what, what is going to happen is that, uh, I lost my train of thought on that one, but. That, that what he thinks is going to happen in terms of, in terms of changing the, the car industry. Yeah. I, I assume. Well, he, he, oh, electrification. So, right. so he thinks that the, the, uh, when you get the cost of a battery to be less than the cost of a motor, 
then it's going to take off. And the battery cost, when I started investing in Tesla, the cost of a battery per car was $35,000 a car. $35,000. It's now maybe twelve or thirteen thousand. The cost of a motor is five or six or seven thousand dollars. The cost of a battery is going to be half of what it is now in three or four years. The cost of a battery keeps falling. The cost of an engine keeps going up. Then, in addition to that, he says that you have to have ten-minute charging. Right now, it's twenty-minute charging for Tesla. He said, "I said, well, how insurmountable is that?" And he says, "Well, he thinks it's technically doable, and you can do it faster." But he is betting on the fact that he thinks autonomous driving is the where he can establish competitive advantage and uh, as opposed to electric vehicles. He says that automobile companies can control how fast that comes on. But I, I disagree with that because there are all these countries that are saying, like China, right. uh, city by city, they're rolling out and saying, no more internal combustion engines. Norway, no more internal, after 2020. And city by city, they're, t they're saying, you can't sell internal combustion engines anymore. It's amazing. So I think electric is something that's going to be really, really exciting for uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Do you think it's going to be? Obviously, you are a huge uh, convert when it comes to this. You have. And I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan and of, of, Dan, of Dan Almond, too. Right. So, what, you got to use natural gas for the grid? I mean, it. it, it How know, about solar? I don't know. But at this well, point, you know, the it, there's not much route. difference in terms of the, the, uh, you know, the carbon footprint, whatever you're talking about, for well, electricity. There's a huge is. difference between natural gas and... Well, natural gas, no, I'm talking about between charging your Tesla, you still got to get the, the power from the grid. And, and so at this point, it's not it's that... It's battery storage business. I happen to think okay. that Tesla can be a $500 billion... That's with the... With the you know, you're, you're 50 cars. You can't put Oldsmobile as a defunct car company. You can't put Pontiac. You can't put the Mercury. They're, as a, I'm, okay. they're models they're of cars. You, you're juicing have, these you know, numbers. To, and you know who you don't have on here? Who? Tucker. Remember Jeff Bridges? He, was was on, he, he only was made on 50 here. cars. And you know what? The dude is not going to work hard enough to make a car. What's wrong, Andrew? You got, a, you got something important? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I see you. You look you really pained. You look <laughs> really pained. Go ahead. I, what, I, what I wanted to Rambler, try to understand. Rambler became AMC. The, AMC's sounds, gone. I know, I, I, but it was <laughs> swallowed up. It's, Student it, Baker, gone. The, you can't do Oldsmobile Just, and Pontiac. Those are models. What, They're what? not all models. They're Nash. mostly models, what you right. got. And you what, don't have what, what if you're okay, let's, 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 let's do it this way. A lot of cars didn't make it. <laughs> okay. well, what, yeah, have your, we'll take that. what have your conversations with, with Elon been like over the past couple of weeks? Um, They've been real interesting. Uh, that I, I think he is really a guy who wants to do the right thing. And he's not an easy person to work for. He's demanding like perfection. Uh, he, you know, he expects other people to work the way he does. I think the reason you had some people leave is not because something's wrong with the cars, it's because he's a tough guy to work for. And uh, I, uh, so, so what I think is that uh, he thinks about how to uh, make his shareholders happy, how to, make his, how to make his customers happy, how to make his shareholders happy, how to make his employees happy. He's always trying. Right. And it's just he's, you know, he's not like other people I've met. When, when, uh, when I was in 1969, 1999, uh, we had an investment in Sotheby's. Mm -hmm. And this historically had been the biggest loss uh, that I have ever experienced. So we invested $500 million out of our eight or $9 billion at the time that we had under management in Sotheby's, $20 a share. I thought the idea was that they were gonna take it and put it onto the internet. Mm -hmm. And the stock went from 20 to 40, so we're making $500 million. Then the chairman gets indicted for price fixing and the stock goes from $40 to 10. And so we lost $250 million, devastating loss. And uh, for me at the time. And I always thought that, that was the worst loss I ever had. But the worst loss was that in 1999, for an entire year, so after the stock goes and doubles to $40, right. I spent the entire year talking to Jeff Bezos and talking to Meg Whitman, uh, Meg Whitman from eBay right. and Jeff right. Bezos from yeah, Amazon. Amazon. And I visited him three times, spoke with him on the phone maybe every month, uh, talked to Meg Whitman a few times, and I wanted to get them to buy Sotheby's. So, so here I am trying to get them to buy this company that I have an investment in and I'm trapped. And, uh, and instead of focusing on, oh my God, this guy is changing the world. If I, that, my biggest mistake is not investing in Amazon. Uh -huh. I'm sitting in the corner right. office, he's laughing, that funny laugh, and I didn't invest right. in him. How can I miss it? But just, so just, I said, if I ever meet right. someone like that again, 
I will invest in, and that's where Elon but comes from. But just speak to the conversations you've had and, and the pressure you think he's under. Because people do quite have questions about just his, his, his ability to, to persevere through all of this, what it feels like. And I know you've talked to him, so. Um, as I said, he's an uncompromising person. Uh, he's innovative. Do you think he takes your advice? Some of it. At the very least, he takes it for a while. He told me that, uh, that he thanked me for sending me a note. Right. Um, so so I, I think he understands, but he's different. And Bezos is different. And uh, so I, I think that Bezos he Bezos is different, but he hasn't made the missteps that Elon's made along the way. You in never term, know. I mean, people make management. thousands of decisions. I mean, his fire uh, Elon's have been pretty public. I, I, I mean, yeah. these are all been. unforced errors. They didn't have, have yes, point. unforced. And they didn't have social media then. But look, this is good for this settlement that they have, to go back to that, it's good for Tesla shareholders, it's good for Tesla, it's good for Elon, and it's good for the SEC. So you think this is a corner that, that will be turned and that we won't see that type of behavior anymore? I'm hoping there's less of it, and I hope there's, uh, there's none of the things that pe they're, are so upsetting to people. Let's talk broadly about the markets, uh, because we've talked about this a lot. Um, we are at new market highs. We've seen where things have come. When you watch this, do you worry about these high levels, or do you think there's more room to run? Um, so, so I think that the market is not at high levels. Uh, 16 times earnings, that uh, uh, growth is accelerating. Uh, multiples of companies should be different, should be higher now than they had been before uh, because you have capital light models instead of having to build car plants, you're having, you're getting, um, or, or hotels, you're getting uh, uh, fees from the assets that other people are investing in businesses. Hmm. So, uh, and that's deserving of higher multiples. And at uh, Choice Hotels, they had $4 billion market value and they got $70 billion of hotels that other people own that they're getting, they're paying them revenues to put people in their hotel rooms. Uh, so, so there's different uh, ways uh, like that, and I think that. So, so my big premise is our big premise is that the stock market uh, is tied very closely to the economy, and the economy doubles roughly every 10 or 12 years, and that means the stock market should double every 10 or 12 years over the long term, and uh, and I, I can't see any reason why that's going to be uh, that's going to change. So if you go back to 1960. It's my typical example. Uh, the Dow Jones was 600. Uh, it's now 26,000. Uh, and you look at the, uh, the GDP of the country, it was 520 billion. It's now 21 trillion. So basically, they both grow 6, 7, 8% a year, uh, 2 or 3% real, and 3 or 4% inflation and, and stocks give uh, dividends. When I, I, last night, I asked my wife, I said, Judy, you know, when we started dating in 1975, now, so you were a systems analyst. How much was your salary? And she said, uh, $20,000. I said, well, I just looked up, and a uh, systems analyst now, uh, salary is $80,000. You should have kept your job. <laughs> but, but that was 3.5% increase per year for salary. That's, that's, the, that's the rate of inflation. That's the so your value of your money is going down by 3 or 4% a year. That's what it costs you to hire someone who has the same qualifications that it had before, 3 or 4% a year. Look up anything you want. And go back, and you will see it's three or four percent a year, except for something like land on the ocean, which is probably seven, eight percent a year. But I mean, basically, three or four percent a year—that's the number. And then, so, so we're doing something. We're taking money that's falling in value, a hundred percent certainty it's going to fall in value. Every single democracy that ever existed done the same thing. And then we're taking that asset that's falling and buying something that's increasing in value. Businesses. So the way you protect yourself is by investing in it. So, so uh, I was telling her gold. So gold in 1975 uh, uh, was $130 an ounce. It's now 1,300. That's five and a half percent a year. And the Dow Jones in 1975 was 1,000, and it's now 26,000. That's eight percent a year. Plus, so the stocks are the best play, uh, 1,000 to 26,000, and that's eight percent a year compounded. Plus dividends, a couple percent more. So it's almost 10 percent a year. If, if you think the, the market is so ties, closely tied to the economy, if you think economic growth is picking up, then that might be reason for thinking stocks are going to pick up, too. Do yes. you think that's the case? Yes. And inflation is going to do better, and growth will be faster. Technology is going to be better. So, so when, when I, I, I sent you before uh, a, a listing of, of, of stocks that we had invested in, and I said that 
that in 1992, we had $100 million under management and now have $29.58 billion. And we made our clients $27.3 billion in, in realized and unrealized gains. $27.3 billion out of the 29.5 or 6 is from the gains that we've achieved. And so I happen to think that if we don't have flows, then and we, we are getting flows. But if we don't have flows, then, uh, then I think that we could double our money again next five or six or seven years. And if you look at that list of companies, we've made in 15 stocks. Now, I didn't start off to be a long-term investor. And that wasn't the idea. The idea was I was selling research for commissions. And so my idea was, if we're getting, am I going too far in this? No, no. Mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, so we're getting 1% uh, commissions. That they were fixed rates in the 1970s. And so I would, get, I would invest in Disney and McDonald's and Federal Express and Nike and Mattel and Hyatt and Dalen, which ultimately became uh, from Home Depot. And so I invest in these companies. And my idea was, if I got eight, someone to invest $800,000 and buy 1,000 shares of an $800 stock, I would make an $8,000 commission. And I said, it did take me long to figure out that if I got them to make, give me an $8,000 commission for buying 1,000 shares of something, $800,000 investment, then if I got them to sell $800,000, I would also make another $8,000 commission. So I was buying and selling. And, and then I look back in 10 years and I say, oh my god, what a disaster I've been all these companies that I was recommending initially, look what they became. And, and I could have been rich, you know, 20, Instead 30. Instead of buying the stocks instead of recommending Buying and holding. Buy them. Right. Right. That's where the buying and holding comes from. It comes from looking back and seeing to try to find these businesses that can double in size and investing right. in them and keeping them. Um, you talk about doubling size and maybe to bring the, bring the interview, because I know we're going to come to an end in a moment, uh, back to Tesla. You did say at one point that you thought this would be a trillion dollar company by 2030. Yes. That, that would be much more than doubling. Yes. Um, 20 times, 30 how that, times. How does that happen in your scenario? Boy, it's really hard. And it's hard. It's really hard. And there could be, so, but he has all kinds of products. Uh, he, I think it could be a $500 billion battery business, $500 billion car business. I think that I give that better than 50-50 chance. I give the fact that it could be a $60 billion company in three years, I give that maybe 80% chance. So I think that in three years we can triple our money, and I think in, uh, if, if you take my scenario and, and I'm right, and I think there's better than 50-50 chance in, in uh, 12 years that he's going to get to a trillion dollars of revenues of revenues, that means you're making $150 billion a year. $150 billion a year, the company's selling for $50 billion right now. You want to give it a 10 multiple, you want to give it a, a 5 multiple, you want to give it a 15 multiple. So basically, that's a big number compared to where it is right now. It could be 30 times. Right. But it, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of things. You can't just go out there. It's not like just advertising, getting people to buy your service. You've got it's a lot of things that have to break your way. Yes. And virtually every other car company in the, in the business has to either go out of business. Or... So, no. I mean, I'm talking about selling 10 million cars. There's 90 million cars a year that are sold in 17 million in the United States. I'm talking, I think this is going to be the biggest car company. I think they have 10, or 10 million cars, 15 million cars a year. And I think the battery business, where there's all this technology in the batteries, I think the battery business is going to be the biggest the car business. And I'm not even talking about being an Airbnb type of business that you have where you drive your car to your plant, you have $500 a month of payments for your car, and instead of you making them, then that car is just going to drive away as part of the Tesla fleet, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, someone's going to use it during the day, and then that, that money that is obtained from it, uh, half will go to you and half will be going to Tesla. And that's a business where Tesla has no money tied up. And then in addition to that, if those cars that they sell for $40,000, they buy back for $20,000, it's 100,000 miles that you can uh, you know, do a year and you charge uh, and you get 50,000 revenue miles, $50,000 a dollar a mile, 50,000 for $20,000 investment, that's a big deal too, dropping 15,000 cars a mile. I think the car companies overall are way behind and they're hoping that they can delay the onset of electrification for, they know it's coming, but they would hope that they could delay it because they have hundreds of billions invested in plants that make motors, which is their competitive advantage. That's going away because you're not going to need motors anymore. Ron, I want to thank you very much for being with us today. Thank Great you. to see you. Thank you for the conversation. Ron Barron.